The Torah tells us that Yaakov had lived 147 years. The last 17 years of his life, he lived in Egypt. And there's a word from Rabbeinu Bachio that the, the portion begins, Vayu Chayisoro. Excuse me. Vayichi Yaakov. And Yaakov had lived. The numerical value of Vayichi is 34. The first 17 years of Yosef's life, Yosef was with his father. The last 17 years of Yaakov's life, he had spent with Yosef. So in all, he had spent 34 years with Yaakov. Vaychi Yaakov, the Eretz Mitzrayim. Yaakov lived in Egypt. What was the essence of Yaakov's life? The numerical value of Vaychi. The 34 years that he'd spent with Yosef, who was the apple of his eye, the most special of his children, that was considered the ultimate value of his life, to be with Yosef. Although he lived 147 years, but what was that time spent with Yosef was the most special time. Comparatively speaking, that was his life because of his love for Yosef. The first 17 years and then he disappears for 22 years. He believes that he was devoured by a beast. After 22 years pass, his sons return from Egypt and they say, Yosef is still alive. He's the viceroy of Egypt, the master of Egypt. He's the sustainer of the world. Yaakov says, I must go immediately and see my son Yosef before he, I pass away. What, what was the root? What was the love of Yosef? Yaakov's love for you, what was it rooted in? And what? We had read that Yaakov married two wives. He had Rochel, he had Leah. He had a very difficult, contentious father in law, putting it mildly. Love on, he was an evil man. And Yaakov comes penniless, has nothing except for the shirt on his back and his walking stick. And he says to Lavon, I will work seven years for the hand of Rachel. Then Lavon goes and deceives him and switches Leah for Rachel under the chuppah. And now he works another seven years for Rachel. See, in conjunction, he worked, spent 14 years working for both wives. After 14 years pass, Rachel was barren. She gives birth to Yosef. In the 14th year, towards the end of the 14th year, in the home of Lavan, Yaakov says to Lavan, I'm ready to go back. Why was he ready to go back when Yosef was born? So Rashi over there cites the Midrash that there's a verse in Ovadia. Ovadia is one of the prophets, and he writes, Beis Yaakov Eish, the house of Jacob is the equivalent of fire. Beis Yosef Lahova, the house of Yosef is the equivalent of a flame. Beis Esav Kash, and the house of Esav, Esau is like straw. If you have a fire and you have straw, the fire is not able to burn the straw unless the fire reaches out and comes in contact with the straw. So what do you need to consume the straw? You need a flame. Who is the flame? The flame is Yosef. Because the prophet refers to as Beis Yosef Lahova. In Hebrew, Lahova means a flame. So when Yosef was born, Yaakov knows at this moment he's able to contend with Esau and he doesn't have to be concerned he'll be destroyed by him. Because the Talmud tells us that in Zaro shall Esau no fail, it'll be Zaro shall Rochel. That the progeny of Esau fall into the hands of the progeny of Rochel. 
Therefore, Yaakov is ready to go. How is it possible Yaakov lived in an alien environment, everything which was the antithesis of holiness and spirituality, contrary to everything, and Yaakov was able to retain and maintain his spirituality, not to be minimized as much as Nyota. He was able to raise a family there, all holy, the patriarchs of each one of their tribes. How's he, how's it possible to raise such, such a family in such an environment? The answer is Yaakov, we know, as we've spoken in the past, is the patriarch of exile. Yaakov, being who he was, has the ability to deflect all the evil influences of that type of environment. That was Yaakov. Who was Yaakov's successor? Yaakov's su success was Yosef. As the Torah tells us, Yosef looked like his father. He was the wisest of all his children and many other reflections of identical situation. So just as Yaakov is the patriarch, that he was able, able to contend with all the negativity and overwhelming forces of exile, Yosef had that capacity. And that's why Yosef, although he was in Egypt all by himself for 22 years, he survived as Yosef Hatzadik. He was able to maintain his devout state and his holy state, despite everything. Because he had the internal wherewithal to be able to deflect, as his father deflected, all the influences. But Yosef only has that ability if he's able to maintain himself as that righteous person. So the first 17 years of Yaakov's life with Yosef, what was the value of that, those years? He was mentoring Yosef to be his what? To be a successor. He was his protege par excellence. And he was meant to step into his shoes when he passes on to guarantee the spiritual survival of the Jewish people. That's Yosef. So uh, the first 17, 14, 17 years of his life, he was under the tutelage of Yaakov. Now he comes to Egypt and he finds Yosef intact. Yosef was the tzaddik. Now he spends another 17 years with him. What is Yaakov's interaction with Yosef during this last 17 years? Again, he's solidifying and guaranteeing that when he passes on, Yosef is going to be the one to guarantee the survival of Jewish people in Egypt. So when we speak about the life of Yaakov, what did Yaakov live for? He lived only for God's glory. He lived only that God's objective of creation should be addressed, meaning there should be a Jewish people at Sinai receiving the Torah and living by it, which is the objective of creation. That was Yaakov's thrust and every fiber of his being was committed and dedicated to that. That was Yaakov. Yaakov has to guarantee and make sure that his successor is able to carry on, which is Yosef. So we say, Vayichi Yaakov, Beretz Mitzrayim, Shvai Shana. He lived 17 years in Egypt. Now, those 17 years, what were the value? It was again, it was to continue mentoring and guaranteeing that Yossi should be his proper successor and address all the issues that had to be addressed. That's the Vayichi. So the numerical value of Vayichi is 34. The first 17 years of Yosef's life, he was mentored by his father. And the last 17 years of Yaakov's life, being associated with Yosef, he put so-called the finely touches on that mentoring that he should have the ability to provide and oversee responsibly, spiritually speaking, not only providing the material for what, that there should be a Jewish people after 
210 years when they leave Egypt. That's Vayechi. A person is committed to his Judaism, to the Torah tradition, and he lives and he sacrifices for it. And the end of his life, he has what to show for all that sacrifice. He's a believing, dedicated, unswerving Jew. His peer group, who he grew up with, they made the other choices. And they went and they pursued the material and they compromised on their Judaism, on the values, on the beliefs. So though materially speaking, this man is considered a pauper compared to what they are. But does the man feel, the man who was willing to give it all up for his Judaism, for spirituality, what does he feel? Does he feel denied or underprivileged or lacking anything? That person feels fully fulfilled. His life was worth living for. All the sacrifices were worth living for. Because this man is on top of the mountain now. He has the VIP entry door into the world to come. These other people, unfortunately, they made bad choices. So we speak by a chi and he lived. What is living? Every night we say in the blessings of the Shema, Keheim Chayenu Vorachimenu. These are, this is our life. This is the length of our days. And we should meditate in Torah, day and night. So what's, what's our life? What's the life of a Jew? Everything in a Jew's life, we're talking about the material, the financial success, what's its value? Its value has no value unto itself. Its value is only to facilitate the spirituality. We read in Pirkei Avos in Kemach in Torah. We live in a physical world. You need material to be able to maintain yourself. That's its only value. We're living with human beings. We have physical needs. They have to be provided for. To what extent? To the extent that our physicality should not be denied. Otherwise, it would compromise our ability to succeed in the spiritual. But every aspect of the physicality, its value is only to facilitate the spirituality. Therefore, King Solomon says in Proverbs, tzaddik ochel l'sov a tzaddik only eats, to what point? To sate his soul. As long as soul is sated, that's the value of the material, that he's able to maintain himself physically. If my soul is sated, I don't need more than that. And that's Mechi Yaakov. Yaakov was a phenomenally wealthy man. He had herds and flocks and possessions. And But what was his life? His life was the patriarch of the Jewish people. To maintain them and guarantee that ultimately they should stand at Sinai and become God's people, the holy nation who will be the ones to glorify God's name until the end of time. That is the value. The days of Yaakov, Torah tells us, the days of Yisrael coming close to pass away, and he summons his son Yosef. And he adjures him, and he says it, he begs of him, I don't want to be buried in Egypt. And he adjures him with an oath not to be buried in Egypt. And Rashi cites three reasons why he doesn't want to be buried in Egypt. Firstly, 
Until Yaakov came to Egypt, there was a famine. When Yaakov came to Egypt, the famine ceased. Ceased to be. Because the blessing he had given to the Pharaoh was that the Nile should rise and irrigate the fields. That was the bracha that Yaakov had given to Paro, the king. Here, the country was at the brink of extinction. There was no rain, there was a famine. The most extreme famine in the history of existence. Yaakov comes, things change immediately. Yaakov is a holy man. Yaakov was concerned that if he passes away, he will be deified. He didn't want to be deified. Why? Because God forbid, if he's, although it's not something he encouraged, because we find when God destroyed the Egyptians, not only did he destroy the Egyptians, he destroyed the deities that they had worshipped. Yaakov wanted nothing to do with that. He didn't want to be put in the position, God forbid, that he should be the object to deny the reality of what God is. That's one reason. But the Midrash cites another reason why he didn't want to be there. But right now, we'll leave it at that. So Yaakov says to Yosef, and I want you to take an oath. And Yaakov, Yosef says, I will do what you request of me. Before Yaakov had gone to Egypt, and he was in Beersheba, God appears to Yaakov in a dream, and he says, don't be fearful to go to Egypt. You will go down. I will go down with you. Your son, Yosef, will put his hands on your eyes when you pass away, and he will bring you back and bury you in Canaan. God gave him a guarantee. So if God gave him a guarantee, what does he have to do? a jury Yosef to put him in a position that he has no choice but to take him out of Egypt and bury him in Canaan. God said, it's going to be. Nevertheless, we have to do what we have to do. He has to take initiative. If the, his initiative doesn't work, he's going to be buried in Canaan, in the tomb of Machpelah, because God said so. But we have to do whatever we can to facilitate that. That's called initiative, human initiative. It's very interesting. I mentioned, the Medjish tells us that the two human beings who had experienced the greatest glory of existence, nobody in the history of the world was ever honored the way these two individuals were, were honored. One of them is Yaakov, the father of Yosef, and the other one was Yisro, the father of Moshe. What happened? We find that when Yo Yaakov came to Egypt, Yosef, the viceroy, goes and hitches his own chariot to go see his father. Yosef was a man who was so revered and esteemed because he had the keys to life. He was the sustainer of the world. This man goes and hitches his own chariot. You know what that means? He could have had 10,000 slaves hitching that chariot. The visor goes and hitches the chariot to go see his father, to greet his father. Evidently, his father really must be a special person. If Yosef goes to greet his father, all the royal family, don't you think they're following Yosef? And when the royal family is following Yosef, don't you think all the ministers of the royal court are going to follow the royalty? And if they go, don't you think the populace is going out to greet Yaakov, to follow all those who are going? As a result of this, the whole Egyptian population, as many people as there were, the head of civilization goes to greet Yaakov, to give him this honor. This is the greatest world honor any human being has ever received. Let's say he wouldn't have experienced this honor. Wouldn't have. And Yaakov would have come to Egypt, had the audience with 
the king, given the blessing, and the Nile would have risen, and that would have ended the famine. Would have anybody known the source and the basis of how that came about? Nobody would know. Nobody would even know Yaakov was in Egypt. But as a result of what happened, Yaakov was a public figure. He's the father of the viceroy, and what honor was he given? He was given an honor which no human being has ever been given the honor in the history of existence. But who was Yaakov? Was he a material being? Was he into the mundane? Or is a person totally removed from, from physicality? That's who he was. And when he comes, the famine ceases. He's the source of all blessing. So when he dies, what do you think they're going to do with him? They're going, to, they're going to worship him. They're going to deify him. Yaakov says, I don't want to be deified. I don't want to be put in that position. Therefore, I need a guarantee. You take me to the Mars to the tomb of Machpelo, to be buried in Canaan. That's why Yaakov made this request of his son. Only because he had this public image within the context of a spiritual power, therefore, he didn't want to be put there in the position where they're going to worship him. There's a morale. The morale of Prague explains that why did we go to Egypt? Because of the covenant between the parts. Avram had asked the question, and God said, because you asked this inappropriate question, which was a lack of faith, your children will be strangers in the land which is not theirs. They will be enslaved and afflicted for so many years, and then they will go out with great wealth. Now, why did God choose Egypt to be that location of exile, to be the location that we should be enslaved? Why? That's the question. So the Raul of Prague cites a Midrash that the Midrash tells us based on the verse that it is impossible to extract light from darkness. But yet, Avram being the son of Terah, whose father was an idolater, the Midrash says that's the equivalent of extracting light from darkness. Only God can extract light from darkness. From who, from where did the Jewish people emerge? We emerge from the nations of the, of, of the world. That's extracting light from darkness. Something which has no element of Kedusha, of holiness. How do you extract holiness from something which is devoid of holiness? But nevertheless, where does the ultimate level of holiness emanate from? From something, a location which is a vacuum where there is no holiness. What's the reason? Because since it has no relevance to that context, to its location, therefore the purest level of holiness emerges from there, which has no relevance to its, to, to its origin. Avram was Avram unrelated to what his father was. The Jewish people are the Jewish people unrelated to where we emerged from. Biologically, we came, we were part of the progeny of Shem. But in terms of what we were, have nothing, nothing to do with that. Now, of the 70 root nations, the Egyptians are the most devoid of spirituality. The prophet Yecheskel refers to the Egyptian people as donkeys. He says, their flesh is like the flesh of donkeys. So the Moral Prague explains in Hebrew, the word for donkey is chamor. A chamor is a donkey. In Hebrew, the word for material is chomer. Chomer means material. Of all the nations of the world, the Egyptians are the most devoid of spirituality. And that's why in Egypt, you had witchcraft at a level where it didn't exist anywhere else in the world like in Egypt. Which, of course, witchcraft is the nether forces. They manipulate the nether forces. That's what witchcraft is. Incest, adultery, idolatry. Every 
the most extreme level of impurity existed in Egypt. Why? Because there was a total void of spirituality. Therefore, from there, the Jewish people emerged. Emerging from there means we have no relevance to that environment. It's, it's like an ex nihilo. Just as ex nihilo is something from nothing, the Jewish people emerged. For, it had to be a, a setting of nothing. Therefore, we emerged at that advanced level. To ultimately, when we left, we were qualified to receive the Torah at Sinai. That's the morale of Prague. Okay? Now, what is the law if a person has a calf born to him of a cow, the first issue of its womb? The Torah tells us it's naturally holy, naturally holy, and has to be brought as a sacrifice. What about if you have a donkey and the donkey gives birth to a male? The Torah says you have a choice. You can either redeem it with a sheep. You take a sheep and you say the sheep should be in place of the firstborn donkey. And you give that donkey, you give the sheep to the coin. So that is the means of redemption. That's called the redemption of the of the donkey. It's called pigeon petachamor, the redemption of the first issue of the donkey. So the se, the sheep in Hebrew, se is the sheep, redeems the donkey. Yaakov says to Yosef, the Egyptian people are compared to the donkey. As Yecheskel says, Yecheskel the prophet, Besorah, Chamor, Besorah. The flesh is the flesh of donkeys. I myself, I myself am compared to the sheep. Why? There's a verse in Prophets. It says, Pe, Se, Pezuri, Yisrael. Yisrael is the equivalent of the scapegoat. We are scapegoat. Yaakov is the ser. So Yaakov is the Yosef. The Egyptians are the donkey. I am the sheep. If you bury me in Egypt, I don't, I'll be a redemption for the donkey. I don't want to be their redemption. Therefore, I don't want to be buried in Egypt. That's the Midrash. The question is, what does this mean? How is him being buried in Egypt? How would there be a redemption of the donkey? Of the Egyptian? Of their material status? So the way I understand it is this way. When a person worships a deity, in what context do you worship it? Now, Yaakov himself was a person who was removed from physicality in total. He was a holy man. He's a man who radiated holiness. When you worship him, how do you worship a deity? To emulate his life. If, you would, if the Egyptian would start emulating Yaakov's life, that's the way they would pay homage to him. That's the way they would worship him. What would be? Even they, they worship as a deity. They'd be elevating themselves. They'd be mimicking or being trying to imitate Yaakov's spirituality. So until Yaakov is buried there, what are they? Earthy, material, immersed, hedonistic existence at the most extreme level. If Yaakov is buried there and they start worshiping him, what happens? They start weaning themselves from that material. So that means they become less chamor, they're less donkeys, they're less materialistic. If they're less materialistic, what happens? The Jewish people that are going to merge from that environment are gonna be at a less advanced level. I don't wanna be the redemption for the chamor from that material to elevate him from the material state. Of course, the consequence will be, ultimately, the Jewish people that leave after 210 years are gonna be less, of, have a less capacity, a less potential for spirituality. Therefore, Yaakov says, I don't wanna be buried in Egypt for that reason. That's the understanding. But now he goes, and Rashi cites the Midrash. Mm -hmm. 
that Yaakov says to Yosef, I know all these years you have a claim against me. What's the claim against me? Here I'm asking you to bury me in Canaan, the tomb of Machpelah. And when your mother died on the road, instead of bringing her to the tomb of Machpel to bury her, I buried her on the way, on the way of Beis Lechem. And I want to explain to you why I did it. Because I know that you have a gripe against me in your heart, but I'm going to explain to you now. That that I did it was based on a divine communication. God wanted it. Why? Because when the Jews will go into exile after the destruction of the first temple and they're going to pass by the grave of your mother, Rachel will come out of her grave and she will supplicate God for the return of the Jewish people from exile. And that is the importance why she has to be buried on the way. So when the Jews leave Israel to go to Babylon, they should pass by her grave and she will come out and she will cry at the highest level and Hashem will respond, the children will return to their borders. That's why I buried there. That's, the, that's, she says, although I know you've had this claim against me all these years in your heart, I'm gonna to explain to you now. So I ask the question, if Yaakov knows that Yosef has this claim and this gripe against him all these years and it's bothering him. So he'd say when he was younger, maybe he was too immature to appreciate it. Yaakov is now 17 years in Egypt. When he first arrived, Yosef is very mature. He's sustaining the world. He's feeding the world. He's overseeing a country, the most advanced civilization. He should have explained to him immediately. If he knows that he has a claim in his heart against him for behaving, which he believed was a disrespect to his mother, explain it immediately. Why let him harbor these ill feelings towards him where he could have clarified it earlier? Why does he wait till the last moment, right before he dies, to explain to him why he did it? That's the question I asked. So I think the answer is this. Very often, somebody has an issue, a problem, and a claim, and you explain it to him why the claim should not be a claim. So the person says to that person, after he explains it to him, and he explains it very well, and what he said is correct and truthful. He says, I hear what you're saying, but that's very often the response. But you still hurt or you feel that you weren't giving your due, and because you weren't giving your due, as much as intellectually you understand it, you're not able to internalize the value of what was done. And therefore you still feel that ill feeling within you. Now, what is the difference between a leader, a person who's a true leader, a person who leads, does not live for himself. He lives for the people. And although he may compromise himself, he doesn't see, see himself compromised because his value is only the leadership position, to lead the people. Rachel being the main matriarch of Yaakov, she should have been buried in the tomb of Machpelah not on the road. If Yaakov would have shared with him, it's because God communicated him. She should be there because when the Jews go into exile, they should pay, 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 pass her grave. When he explains to him at that point in his life, what exactly is Yosef's position? He's the son of Yaakov. He has, he's talented. He has genius, one of a kind. And whatever, he oversees a country but he's not responsible for the Jewish people. He's not yet the successor of Yaakov. Only once you become and you go in, and you're wearing Yaakov's 
shoes and you step into his shoes and you have that level of responsibility and you carry the responsibility, the guarantee, the survival and the eternity of Jewish people, only then do you appreciate what it means Rachel should be buried on the way. You have to have that sense of responsibility. You have the sense of responsibility. I understand why it has to be that way. And it's, it's correct, it should be that way. So it's not only abstract intellectual understanding, it's fully internalized that as a leader, as a person who's a caretaker, as to be fully responsible for their present and eternal existence, I understand it is the right thing. Regardless of my mother not being buried in the tomb of Machpel next to my father, it doesn't make a difference. Therefore, Yaakov waited for this moment. If he would have explained it earlier, ya- Yosef would have understood, but it wouldn't have rele- relieved that gripe that he had against him. My mother was still mistreated. Now, all of a sudden, it starts resonating. Now I understand what it's all about. Why it has to be this way, it can't be any other way. Yaakov is about ready to hand over the baton of leadership to Yosef, and now Yosef fully gets it. It's interesting. Right before Yaakov passes away, he says to Yosef, I never believed I'd see you alive. And not only do I see you alive, I see two of your sons. He had brought Ephraim and Asher to receive a blessing. And he says to Yosef, Ephraim and Menashe, Keruvim Shimon Yili. Ephraim and Asher will be the equivalent of my two sons, Reuben and Shimon, just as Reuben and Shimon are tribes. Your children, although they're my grandchildren, they will be like my children, they will be tribes. And they recognize as tribes. Why now? Why did he say it earlier? Because at this moment, Yosef is taking the position of Yaakov. At this moment, Yosef is becoming Yaakov. Now that you are Yaakov, now your children can be the equivalent of tribes. Prior where you're the special person and you yourself are a sibling of the other tribes, your children cannot assume that level of tribes yet. But now that you're stepping into my shoes to become an extension of myself as the patriarch, now your children are the equivalent of my children. As my children, Reuven Shimon, are tribes, your children, if not Menashe, will be tribes. So it's a whole different, he becomes a different reality. It's like a metamorphosis. It's taking place within him, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually speaking, assuming the position of leadership to be the guarantor of the Jewish people in exile. That's what's happening over here. There's a story, there's a historical event that took place in the 1700s. And I once mentioned it. There was a leading Torah sage, world Torah sage. His name was Rabbi Yonas and Apeshitz. And he was a great Kabbalist. And he wrote amulets, Kabbalistic amulets for people to heal them and many for whatever it was. And this was soon after the period of the Shabtai Tzvi, the false messiah, where also he corrupted the, the Kabbalistic writings and he wanted to bring about terrible things. And Another great sage suspected that Rabbi Yodas and Apeshitz was from the sect of the Shabtai Tzvi. And it was all out war. And of course, it was a baseless suspicion, but because other people had access to grind against the great rabbi, Rabbi Yodas and Apeshitz, they falsified things, they did many things that it should be depicted as this person. The battle was never resolved. So the leading Torah sage at that time, his name was Rabbi Cheskel Landau. He was the chief rabbi of Prague, known as Nod Buda. He did not vindicate Rabbi Yonah but he, what he did was, he says, 
we have to make peace. From now on going forward, nobody's permitted to write amulets. But Rebiotis and Apeshitz was never vindicated, never. And Rebiotis and Apeshitz had certain students, which were very special, great Torah sages, geniuses beyond our understanding what a genius is. And they felt they have to teach Rabbi Landau, Chief Rabbi, a lesson that in a way, by not vindicating that teacher, they, he, he disgraced them. And what did they do? They came and they didn't share with him who they were, but they were the students, the closest students of Rabbi Apeshitz. And they posed the question to him, very difficult question regarding the internal organs of an animal, what causes it to be rendered non-kosher, kosher, and they presented to Rabbi Landau, the chief rabbi of Prague, and he realizes it's a difficult question. And he says, I'll need about three days to work on it, to come up with an answer after three days, but they knew the answer that he'd come up with because they constructed the question away. And when he comes up with an answer, which will be convincingly the right answer, immediately soon after that, they're gonna pull the rug out from under him to show that it's incorrect. Three days pass, they come back, and Rabbi Landau was very happy that he was able to come upon the truth to elucidate the problem, and he presents it to them, and they hear it, and they smile, and they say, it sounds right, but, and they show him that it's incorrect, and they refute it, and he agrees. With them, it's not the right answer. So, he goes, he says, I need another three days to work on it. Works on, he works on another three days and they know exactly what answer he'd come up with because the question was constructed in this way, in the most ingenious way. He comes up with an answer. He seems to be very satisfied. He summons them, they come and they say, it sounds, seems to be right, but it's wrong. And again, they refute it and it repeats itself three, four times. After a while, Rabbi Landau, the chief rabbi of Prague, the leading Torah sage of the world, one of them, he realizes that he's not fit and qualified to be the chief rabbi of Prague. Here he's convinced that he's right. And these three people show him that he's totally in the dark and he starts crying. How does he have a right, the audacity to be in the position of such power, of such prestige where he's not qualified to be in the position? So when he starts crying, realizing who he's not, they say to him, we want to explain to you who we are. We are the students of Rabbi Apeshitz. And we're only the students. We can't even hold up a candle to our teacher. And by you not vindicating our Rebbe, you disgraced him. And therefore, we just want you to understand who you disgraced. Because here we pose this question to you, and we, the students, show you that you can't even tackle the problem. That you're not qualified to be the chief rabbi of Prague. So how do you have the audacity not to vindicate our rebbe, our teacher? This is what they said to him. So when he sa they said that to him and they, they exposed themselves, he says, I have no problem now. You've just consoled me. A person who's in the position of leadership merit a special divine assistance to succeed. Because no man is infallible to make mistakes. But if you assume a position of responsibility for a Jewish community, God gives you a, le a special level of clarity, which is called divine assistance to be able to succeed in that capacity. If the question you would have asked me would have been an authentic question, I would have come up with the right answer. But since the question was only contrived to embarrass me and disgrace me, therefore I didn't, which means it's not relative to my position as a leader in this community, therefore I didn't merit the divine assistance. But if it would have been something relating to my responsibility as the chief rabbi of Prague, I would have merited the capacity to be able to come upon that truth. That's what he said to them. And he dismissed them. And he says, I'm not impressed. My decision was a correct decision. 
to quell it, although I didn't vindicate your teacher. Yosef now is about to step into the shoes of his father. The baton is being handed over from Yaakov to Yosef. Yosef is now entering the position to be the equivalent of the patriarch of the Jewish people, to be the caretaker in every sense of the word. When you assume that level of position, you merit a special divine assistant, assistance that there should not be any interference. And now Yaakov's explanation will be fully, will fully resonate with Yosef to understand what is the responsibility of a leader. My mother has to be buried on the wake because when the Jews go into exile to Babylon, they're gonna pass over a grave and she will come out and supplicate and cry for, for them to God, which will guarantee their return after 70 years in exile. It was a known fact, Ramosha Feinstein, he wrote thousands of responsa, thousands, never retracted one, never retracted. How's it possible? You write thousands of responsa, and we're not talking about ordinary, the complicated responsa. You have to be proficient in the whole Talmud at many levels. The answer is because he was the decisor of the generation and he assumed that responsibility and he was committed to that responsibility. Therefore, he merited the divine assistance to always have the clarity, never to make a mistake, and therefore he never had to retract from any, any ruling that he had given. The first mention of illness in the Torah is in this week's proportion. Yaakov was the first human being to be subject to illness. You read the portion, it says, word came to Yosef that his father is ill. Immediately he takes his two sons and he goes to his father Yaakov. Ill means he's gonna die soon. He has to have the blessing of his father to his children. How did he know that he was going to die? Why is illness automatically associated with dying? So the first human being ever to become ill was Yaakov. Why? Because if a person suddenly dies and he hasn't straightened out his personal affairs, things remain in a disarray. Illness is foretelling the person it's time to straighten out whatever has to be straightened out before you pass on. The blessings that Yaakov had given to his children before he passed on are fundamental and crucial and essential for the Jewish people to establish themselves as the Jewish people. That each one of the tribes has a specific objective and purpose and ability and due to Yaakov's blessing to each of them, therefore, they're able to actualize whatever their abilities are. And that all ties in with the objective of creation. Nobody was ever ill. Yaakov had to be ill. To be, realize that it's not too far off he will pass away, therefore, he has to ha set his house in order. The blessings have to be given now. Later, it's going to be too late. See, understand, the whole world is subject to illness because Yaakov had to bless his children and be aware early enough to set his house in order. You know, these Jews, they're always causing these problems. Yaakov is the, is the one, he had to become ill because he had to bless his children. We have to pay the price because he had to bless his children. Let's understand what, 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 what the basis for that claim is. But you see, say to that anti-Semite, I want to explain you something. If not for the Jewish people, there wouldn't be an existence. God created this world for one reason, for the sake of Torah and the only nation which has relevance to that Torah is only the Jewish people. 
if Yaakov wouldn't have set his house in order to bless each of them, his children, to be able to actualize their ability and potential, that means they, they're not qualified to receive the Torah at Sinai. If that's the case, the world has no value. The world reverts back to pre-existence. So that that you exist and the world exists is only because Yaakov gave those blessings to his son. So it was crucial and had to be that Yaakov has to be alerted that his time is soon to come. How, was, how did that alert come across? He became ill. Because no human being ever became ill ever before. That was the alert. I have to, it's now or never. And therefore there's Jewish people. And if there's a Jewish people, God says now my world existence has value and everybody is a beneficiary of the Jews existence. I'm gonna stop here today. If you have any second. <laughs>